Uh, welcome to today's Senate Occasional Lecture. This is the first in our series for 2021. My name is Rachel Callanan and I'm the Clerk Assistant Procedure with the Department of the Senate. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay respect to their elders past and present. We have uh, some a distinguished guests today with us in the audience, and I would particularly like to welcome the former Clerk of the Senate, Dr. Rosemary Lang. After having had to cancel our lectures last year due to the COVID-19 restrictions, it is a real pleasure to be able to kick off the series for 2021 today and to have an audience present to do so. The lecture is also being live streamed on the Australian Parliament House website and is being Auslan interpreted. COVID safe arrangements, of course, are in place for this event and I remind you just to take the usual COVID precautions while you're in Parliament House today. Now, with all of that being said, I am delighted to introduce you to our speakers today, Dr. Sarah Cameron and Professor Ian McAllister. Dr. Cameron and Professor McAllister will share their insights with us into the results of the 2019 federal election as revealed by the 2019 uh, election study. For those unfamiliar, the Australian election study is the leading study of political attitudes and behaviour in Australia, which has uh, surveyed vo voters for over 30 years. The study is run as a collaborative project between several universities and uh, with its long-term home here in Canberra at the ANU. And uh, with the intervening uh, 12 months and following the events of 2020, our speakers are also going to take the opportunity to talk to us about the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic for democratic politics in Australia. Dr Cameron is a political scientist at the University of Sydney. She is Chief Investigator on the Australian Research Council Discovery Project on Political Trust and Satisfaction with Democracy in Australia and has contributed to the election study since 2013. She has also previously held a visiting fellowship at Harvard University and has managed the Electoral Integrity Project. Professor McAllister is Distinguished Professor of Political Science at the Australian National University, and he has also been a director of the Australian election study since 1987. He is also a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia and a corresponding fellow of the Royal Society in Edinburgh. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr Cameron and Professor McAllister. I understand that Professor McAllister will present first and uh, followed by Dr Cameron and after both of them have given their presentations then we'll move to a Q&A session. Professor McAllister. Well, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about this research. Uh, what Sarah and I will do in the next 40 minutes or so is basically talk about three main topics. We look at the result of the 2019 federal election, and we look at the two major issues which determine the outcome of that election, which were the policies and taxation and factors associated with leadership. Then Sarah will take over and she'll look at some of the long-term trends in electoral behaviour, how that may affect um, elections in the future. And then finally, she'll finish off by looking at the impact of the current pandemic. So just before I look at the 2019 election, just a bit of background about the Australian Election Study Survey itself. We've been conducting it since 1987. We've conducted 12 surveys after each federal election. We typically ask about 250 questions of each respondent in the survey, and about 90 of those questions tend to be ones that we ask consistently from election to election. So we've got a huge amount of information about why people voted in the election, what they thought was important, and so on. And it allows us to trace uh, long-term trends in electoral behaviour. The survey we conducted in 2019 uh, went into the field immediately after the election in May, and it was in the field until September. And we surveyed just over 2,000 respondents nationally uh, with a response rate of around about 
Uh, you'll see a website address at the bottom there, australianelectionstudy.org. If you go to that website, you'll see a lot of our reports, uh, academic publications. But perhaps most importantly, there's an online analysis tool which Sarah developed, which allows you to do your own research on the data, and you can also download a copy of the unit record file as well if you want to. So first of all, to look at the factors which affected how people voted in the election. Since 1996, we've consistently asked people what was the most important factor that determined how they voted. And you can see from that graph that consistently across all that time period, it's policies that determine how people vote. There was a bit of a spike there in 1998. That was the election on which the goods and services tax that the Liberals proposed uh, was the major issue in the election. It dropped a bit after that in 2001, and it's been consistently increasing ever since. So in 2019, 66% of people said that policies were the major factor which affected how they vote, voted. And that was pretty similar, actually, to 1998. About one in five people say that it's the, the political parties that determine how they vote. They're thinking there of things like whether the political parties are divided or united and associated things like leadership and party loyalties. And it's round about less than one in 10 who mention the national party leaders or uh, the local candidates that determine how they vote. Now, we consistently ask people what are the most important election issues for them. We actually ask the first most important issue and the second. And the bar chart there looks at the proportion of people who chose one of 10 issues as being the first most important. What we find consistently from election to election is that major issues that determine how people vote and what they think is important in the election tend to be economic management, however defined, health and then education. And this election was very similar to previous elections in the sense that economic management, health, the two top issues. But the worst like differences, you can see that education dropped down uh, to the, the last half of those issues. You'll also note that 11% of people mentioned the environment as their first uh, most important issue, and another 10% mentioned global warming. So if you add those two together, it means that the environment broadly defined was one of the top three election issues. And Sarah will talk a bit more about that uh, in the second part of the presentation. In terms of um, how the party voters uh, observed a lot of these issues, what you can see from this bar chart is that three in four coalition voters thought that economic issues were the most important. 74% mentioned it as the most important issue. Labour voters, by contrast, were more diverse in the issues that they chose as being important. Uh, health, the environment and the economy were the issues that they identified. And perhaps not surprisingly, two thirds of Green voters identified the environment as being the issue that motivated their vote. We also asked people uh, which of the two major political parties they prefer in order to look after these various issues. And again, consistently in this, we see a pattern where the coalition has an advantage over economic issues. And we can see that here with the economy, government debt. There's the order of a 26% point advantage for the coalition on both the economy and government debt, and also on taxation. At the other end, you can see that Labour's got a very strong advantage on issues such as health, education, the environment, and global warming. One of the issues there which is sort of interesting is superannuation, and you can see that there's a coalition advantage there of about 14 percentage points. Going back to 2016, uh, the coalition put forward a series of policies to restrict superannuation and the amount that people could contribute to that. Uh, when we asked that same question in 2016, people saw no difference between the two major parties. And we can see there that um, the uh, coalition advantage has really opened out on that issue. Now, the predominant uh, issue in the election, economic issue, was to do with the taxation of tax changes. And that was a, a series of policies which 
the, the Labour Party put forward. And they basically argued that there should be more stringent taxation of things like uh, tax changes uh, on share dividends, uh, tax imputation, and also changes to the taxation of investment properties through capital gains tax and negative gearing. We asked about those issues in the election. People were very divided on it. Um, slightly more thought it was a, a good policy, um, slightly, more, uh, slightly less thought it was a bad policy. But the net effect of that is that, as you can see from this graph, there was a real division between the two major political parties on the issue of taxation. The coalition uh, got a significant advantage as the party most able to handle the whole issue of taxation. And if we compare that to 2016, there's only a two percentage point gap between the two major parties. And that opened out uh, quite significantly to 13 percentage points in 2019. The other interesting part of that graph is if you look at the proportion of people who thought there was no difference between the two major parties in 2019, it was 14%. Uh, and that's the second lowest since 1990, the other one being the 1998 election, which I mentioned was the one that was fought on the issue of uh, the goods and services tax. Labour's policies in the election uh, on economic policy were really predicated on the idea that asset ownership was really concentrated on relatively small groups of voters who were relatively well off and perhaps able to pay the extra tax that was being proposed. What our research shows is that that's not necessarily the case. There's certainly well-off uh, voters in there who were uh, who wouldn't be unduly affected by those tax changes. But there was also a lot of people, a lot of voters, who were not particularly well off, who were using things like investment properties or share portfolios in order to provide uh, an income in retirement or for purposes of building up superannuation. And one of the major changes that we've seen in the electorate over the last 20 years is this really quite significant build-up in the proportion of asset ownership uh, across the electorate, which has become really hugely important. And you can see from this graph, starting at the top, two-thirds of people say they're homeowners, divided uh, quite equally between people who own their properties outright and people who are paying them off. That, in fact, is a slight decline over the last 20 years or so largely caused by younger people not being able to get into the uh, housing market because of the cost of property. The second bar you'll see there is that about one in three people said that they directly own shares on the Australian Stock Exchange. That actually is also a decline because it was around about the low 50s in the early 2000s when there was the privatisation of Qantas, CSL, Commonwealth Bank and so on. And there was also quite a significant decline after the GFC. But even with 34% of people in our survey saying that they directly own shares, that's one of the largest proportions of direct share ownership in the world, more than the United States, more than uh, Britain, more than Canada. Uh, thirdly, you can see in terms of ownerships of an investment property and also of a self-managed super fund, about one in five people said that they had that economic asset. Now that is about twice the proportion that you find in the Australian Bureau of Statistics surveys and the reason for that is the ABS uses a very legal definition of who owns a super fund or who is an investment property. Our question is uh, largely to do with the people in the household, so you might have a household of four or five people and perhaps legally only one or two people technically own an investment property but the taxation of that asset and any change to it is going to affect a much larger people than that estimate. And I actually think that was one of the mistakes that was made in the policy towards uh, superannuation and property investment. It actually affects a larger proportion of people uh, than is normally assumed. What we find in the survey is that three in four voters own at least one of these assets. And when we compare voting between 2016 and 2019, we find that 19% um, more votes came from people that owned superannuation funds uh, compared to the previous election. So 
really quite a significant shift in votes between those two elections and a shift of about 8% towards the coalition among investment property owners. The other factor, uh, apart from taxation and economic policy, which came out in the election, was the one of leadership. Two things are important here. Uh, one was the relative unpopularity of Bill Shorten as Labour leader, and the other one was uh, the fourth change of Prime Minister in the space of uh, eight or nine years from Malcolm Turnbull to Scott Morrison. And what we find analysing the data is that Bill Shorten's unpopularity was a factor that shifted votes. Change in Prime Minister actually didn't for reasons that I'll explain in a minute. So to put leadership popularity in some long-term perspective, we consistently ask a question of the respondents to rate the party leaders on a scale from zero to 10. And those figures show all of the major party leaders from 1987 through to 2019. And the figures at the end of the bar are the mean value for the score between zero to 10. And you can see at the top that the most popular leaders over the last 30, 40 years, Kevin Rudd in 2007, Bob Hawke in 1987. Uh, Bob Hawke was probably even more important than that in 1983, but we don't have earlier data, which is exactly comparable uh, to our measure. But you can see at the bottom of the, the graph, Bill Shorten is the uh, least unpopular leader over that period, with the exception of Andrew Peacock in 1990. And he was also relatively unpopular in 2016 as well, the fourth uh, most unpopular leader. Now, this is significant because um, there's quite a lot of research which looks at how people evaluate leaders based on their qualities. And we've consistently asked a question in our surveys about how appropriate nine particular qualities apply to the various leaders. Uh, if you look at that graph, you can see that Scott Morrison led Bill Shorten on all of those nine, with the exception of compassionate, and they're both equal there. But the more important point of this is that the research, our research and international research, shows that the most important things that voters actually look for is integrity. So they're looking for honesty, they're looking for leaders who are trustworthy, and they want to see leaders who exhibit leadership. So they want people who exhibit strength, inspiration. And if you look at those various um, characteristics there, you'll see that these were the two things that Bill Shorten actually significantly uh, fell behind Scott Morrison on. And interestingly, we aren't particularly interested in having leaders who are knowledgeable, competent, sensible. That doesn't motivate our voters. That's a, an added extra, possibly. But what people do want is integrity and a sense of leadership. Now, that played out in the survey in the sense that only about 4% of Labour voters said they were motivated by leadership in the election. And if you compare that graph back to 2007, you can see that 20% of Labour voters said they were motivated by it, and that was when Kevin Rudd uh, was standing, who was quite exceptionally popular. But even in 2010 and 2013, you can see that leadership figured quite significantly for Labour voters. For Liberal voters, um, certainly they were more motivated by leadership, certainly in 16 and 19, than Labour voters. But again, comparatively, if you go back to 2001, 2004, the heyday of the, the hard uh, coalition government, you can see leadership was really much more important there. And finally, to finish this part of it off, um, we've had these consistent leadership changes, uh, four of them over the period since 2010. Uh, we've always asked the, the, the people in our surveys what they thought of these leadership changes, and you can see that voters basically don't like it. They particularly didn't like the change from Rudd to Gillard in 2010. Of course, Rudd was very popular with voters, and they didn't like the change from Turnbull to Morrison in 2018, and slightly more ambiguous over the other two changes, but still there was a majority who disapproved of it. We asked a question in the 2019 survey uh, how it would have changed people's votes if Malcolm Turnbull had still have been Liberal leader. What we found was that there was an exodus 
of voters uh, from the Liberal Party, but it almost exactly matched the voters that they attracted by the change. So in fact, it was revenue neutral. It didn't actually affect the outcome of the election. So the two major factors in the election were basically taxation policy uh, and leadership. And I'll leave Sarah and I to continue on and look at some of the long-term trends. Thank you so much. So to follow on from Ian's discussion on the 2019 election, I'm going to highlight some of the long-term trends that we are seeing in the Australian uh, political behaviour and attitudes. Following the 2019 election result, there was a lot of discussion about the emergence of, of two Australias, an increasingly divided electorate that contributed to this unexpected outcome. So with the Australian election study data, I'm going to unpack some of the long-term divisions that have been emerging in the electorate and the implications for the trajectory of democratic politics in Australia. Starting with gender differences, in 2019, there was a big gender voting gap. 10% more men than women voted for the coalition. Uh, and the Greens had an advantage among women compared to me men. Now, if we place this gender gap that was observed in the 2019 election in long-term perspective, we can see that this hasn't always been the case. And in fact, the gender gap in voting behaviour in Australia has reversed over time. So back in the 1990s, a greater proportion of women voted for the Liberal Party and Labor had an advantage among men. And over time, this has gradually reversed so that in 2019, we actually see the biggest gender gap in voting behaviour at any time on record. And there are a number of factors underpinning this transformation of gender and voting in Australia. Firstly, Tremendous social changes within the electorate, including a, a greater number of women undertaking higher education, which is associated with greater support for parties on the left, and importantly, women's greater participation in the labour force. As well as changes within the electorate, there's also been considerable changes within the political parties over this time. Back in the 1990s, women were similarly underrepresented in both the Liberal Party and the Labor Party. And what we've seen since then is a dramatic increase in women's representation in the Labor Party, reaching 48% uh, in the last election, whereas progress in the Liberal Party has been much slower, reaching 26%. And there's also been a shift in the issue priorities of parties over this time. In particular, the Labor shift from a focus on working class issues to also focus on progressive social issues. So there's a range of factors contributing to this gender gap in political behaviour. And we don't just see it in Australia. The same trend has been observed in the United States and also in Europe. We are also seeing big generational differences in political attitudes and behaviour. Looking at the 2019 election, Labor voters were primarily voting for Labor and the Greens. Whereas if you look at those aged 65 and over, a majority are voting for the coalition. And once again, we can place this voting behaviour seen in 2019 in long-term perspective to see whether this is a continuation of what has happened in the past or whether it was unique to 2019. And it's a little bit of both. Younger Australians have always been further to the left of older Australians. But what we are seeing is a growing divide over time, uh, such that in the 2019 election, the gap 
in voting behaviour between older and younger Australians was greater than at any other point on record. Normally, what we see is that as voters get older, they shift further to the right in their political preferences. Although as millennials and Generation Z are further to the left uh, to begin with, this has potential long-term ramifications for the preferences of Australian voters as this younger generation becomes older. We also see evidence of a generational divide looking at ideology. This graph here shows where people place themselves on average on a left to right scale from zero to 10. And what it shows is that over time, the electorate has been gradually moving to the left. And younger people um, have over time consistently been further to the left of the electorate as a whole. But again, we're seeing strong evidence of generational change with the current younger generation being much further to the left of previous generations when they were young. There was a lot of discussion around the 2019 election about 2019 being a climate change election. And although Labor, which as Ian showed was the preferred party on environmental issues, although Labor uh, lost the election, we do see some support for the idea that 2019 was a climate election. Looking here at the trends, you can see that one in five voters identified an environmental issue as being their top concern in the election, and that was a greater proportion than at any time on record. And again, we can see evidence here of this generational divide, because if we look at the youngest group of voters, it was about 50% of them that saw the environment as being their top concern. And those figures are in the context of a global wave of climate change protests that took place in 2019, including in Australia, that was very much led by young people. Scott Morrison declared the 2019 election a victory for the so-called quiet Australians, which is a somewhat ill-defined term which has been compared to John Howard's battlers. And a key question that's asked in these discussions about quiet Australians and battlers is whether uh, the working class who have traditionally voted Labor, whether they have been shifting their votes to the coalition over time. The Australian election study data provides us with a number of ways to look at the voting behaviour of different social classes. And as Ian highlighted, understanding class uh, is not so straightforward. Understandings based on occupation no longer reflect the complexity of class in modern Australia with the increasing importance of asset ownership. Just one way of looking at class is how voters identify themselves. We ask a question in the survey about whether people see themselves as working class, middle class or upper class. Now very few say they see themselves as a member of the upper classes and about 50-50 see themselves as working or middle class. And this chart here shows the voting behaviour of those who see themselves as working class over time. And what it shows is that Labor still does have the advantage among the working class by a margin of about 10 percentage points. Although if we look at the long term trend, we do see an erosion of Labor's working class base over time. So back in the 1980s, uh, Labor attracted 60% of the working class vote, and that is now down to around 40%. And similarly, we see that uh, asset owners, whether it be home ownership, investment property ownership, or share ownership, this is all associated with a greater likelihood of voting for the Liberal Party. So class is still important in explaining voting behaviour, 
Although some of the traditional patterns are eroding over time, while new class divisions, in particular based on assets, are of increased importance. Another big change that has emerged in the Australian electorate over time is increasing voter volatility. Back in the 1960s, it was about 70% of Australians who cast their ballot in the same way in every election. At the last election, that was down to less than 40%. And we see a number of indicators all pointing in a similar direction. There's an increasing proportion of voters who are making up their mind during the election campaign rather than far in advance. And there's an ever-growing proportion of voters who do not align themselves with any party at all. About one in five voters, which is the highest at any point on record. So combined, these factors are leading to more unpredictable elections. And this is both an opportunity and a challenge for political parties who can no longer rely on particular groups of voters for their support and increases the importance of the election campaign and of leadership. A final factor where we are seeing big shifts in the electorate over time is in citizens' attitudes towards democracy in Australia. There are various indicators showing record levels of disaffection. In 2019, satisfaction with democracy reached the lowest level since the 1970s Whitlam dismissal uh, at less than 60%. And just one in four voters believed that people in government could be trusted to do the right thing. And to place these results in international comparison, what we can see is that, so back in 2007, 86% of Australians were satisfied with democracy. And that would pl have placed us among the top of this list of OECD countries alongside uh, Norway and Switzerland. And since then, we have dropped down to the middle of the pack among other democracies in the OECD. So what explains and what is driving this considerable decline in democratic satisfaction that we have seen in Australia? Some people have argued that this is just a reflection of trends that are happening around the world. Well, we can compare what's happening in Australia to other countries to see whether this is the case. And we do see a decline in democratic satisfaction in some other countries, notably in the UK following the Brexit referendum and also in the United States following the 2016 election of Donald Trump. But this is not a universal trend. As we can see, uh, levels of satisfaction have remained stable in Canada and New Zealand. So some explanations have blamed this on, well, maybe it's uh, social media, maybe it's disaffected young people, although Canada and New Zealand also have social media and young people, and yet they haven't seen this decline in democratic satisfaction. So what the evidence is showing is that the de very steep decline in satisfaction with democracy that we've seen in Australia is driven by government performance including the leadership uh, changes that took place uh, with great frequency over the 2010s, and as Ian highlighted, a majority of voters disapproved of. So far, we've spoken a lot about the 2019 election and also long-term trends up to 2019. But of course, there are a few things that have changed since 2019, we now find ourselves one year into a major global crisis, which has significant implications for democratic politics around the world, including here in Australia. And it's first important to note that this is a multifaceted crisis. 
combining a major public health crisis with a major economic crisis. And we can look to research on previous crises to see how crises can shape democratic politics. And studies have found that in the context of certain types of crises, voters can rally round the flag, by which I mean giving greater support to incumbent leaders and incumbent governments at a time of crisis. And this has particularly been shown in the context of external military threats. An example is uh, following 9-11, George W. Bush's approval ratings skyrocketed. At the same time, there's also extensive research on the effects of economic conditions on voter behaviour and attitudes, with the central idea being that citizens will punish governments for poor economic performance. Although in the context of a global crisis, benchmarking can become important. How well is a particular country doing in comparison to other countries also facing a particular crisis? So given the unique uh, nature of the current crisis, it raises questions about its effects on citizen attitudes. And we can investigate this by looking at the approval ratings of political leaders, including Scott Morrison and also Boris Johnson, the UK Prime Minister, as a point of comparison. And what this shows, firstly, is you can see before the pandemic hit, Morrison's approval ratings were exceptionally uh, low as a reflection of his handling of the bushfire crisis last summer. And then for both Scott Morrison and Boris Johnson, we do see evidence of this rally round the flag effect. Back in March to April of last year, when lockdowns were first introduced in many countries around the world, we see a big boost in support for both prime ministers by about 20 percentage points. And then what happens over time? You can see that support for Scott Morrison has remained exceptionally high throughout the pandemic, whereas this effect was relatively short-lived for Boris Johnson. And we can compare uh, the experiences of these two countries in handling COVID-19. Of course, Australia has done exceptionally well, whereas the UK has been one of the most affected countries uh, during the pandemic. And we can see further evidence of this rally round the flag effect in Australia for confidence in both state and federal governments with some data that's been collected from the ANU poll, another survey that is run out of ANU. So we can see here that there has been a huge improvement in attitudes towards government since the beginning of the pandemic. And differentiating the data by state here, we can see that Victorians lost some confidence uh, in the state government in particular, associated with the second wave of COVID-19 in Victoria and consistent with the state government's responsibility for managing hotel quarantine, which was the source of the outbreak. And then in Queensland, we can see an increase in support and confidence in Anastasia Palaszczuk's uh, government in association with border closures to other states last year. So we started 2020 uh, with record low levels of trust, as I highlighted. And what COVID-19 has done is increased confidence in government and support for incumbents as a result of this rally round the flag effect. And this increased support for incumbents gives them an electoral advantage. So speculation that we hear about an early election in Australia stems from the very high level of support that the government uh, currently enjoys and the potential to capitalise on that. So to sum up, 
the long-term trends are showing an increasingly volatile electorate. Old divisions such as class and gender are changing over time. The gap between younger and older Australians has never been greater. Partisanship has reached record lows. And all this is contributing to greater unpredictability in electoral politics in Australia. And following these record levels of disaffection in 2019, the COVID-19 crisis and Australia's relative success in handling the crisis has ushered in a lot of support for incumbent governments. The crisis has become the salient issue at the expense of other issue areas. And we could expect that continuing support for the current government is conditional on its handling of the COVID-19 crisis. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to Professor McAllister and Dr Cameron uh, for helping us to uh, unpack and understand some of that data and for sharing your insights into the factors that influenced the 2019 election. Um, and thank you also for the observations in relation to the pandemic, the experience we went through last year, and that helps us, I guess, set the scene for what we might expect in the coming election, which will either be 2020 or 2021. We'll wait and see. Um, we're now going to move to a Q&A session. Um, you can see that in the room we've got two microphones, so if you're interested in asking a question, perhaps you could um, put up your hand, and then one by one we'll ask you to come to the microphone and um, ask your question. Um, so do we have any questions from those in the room? Yes, uh, thank you to the lady in the nice dress, up to the microphone, thank you. Hello, thank you very much. So I'm just wondering if you could comment on the role of independence, um, what the trends are and maybe a forecast for what you see as um, potential role of independence in the next election. Because of these trends of declining partisanship and people's disaffection with the major political parties, this has created an opportunity both for minor parties and also uh, for independents to capitalise on people's disaffection with the main parties. Although that said, heading into uh, the next election, we are in a different position than we were in 2019 election because of this increased confidence in the current government, uh, which may have an impact on people's willingness to go towards uh, minor parties and independents. Thank you. Um, and the gentleman there in the dark shirt. Thank you for the presentation, it was very good. Um, I was wondering if your data correlates to the data that the major political parties gather. Like, is it consistent? Is it, uh, do you get access to it? Can you comment on that? The major political parties obviously keep their own data very close to their chest. So I would be amazed if our data was different. Um, the main difference is that we go into the field after the election so we asked people how they voted in the election, what they thought of the leaders and so on. The major political parties aren't interested after the election, they're interested before. So they're looking at campaign dynamics and things like that. But given the nature of surveys, how they're conducted, uh, they're extremely robust in most cases. I'm sure they're looking at the same data that we're looking at, except Ours are much better in the sense that they're after the event, we ask a lot more questions, we have a much better response rate, so much more in depth and robust. Uh, yes, thank you. With the, in, with the increasing emphasis on early voting, um, especially given the COVID-19 coronavirus crisis, um, how do you see that influencing the 2019 election and future elections? Yeah, one of the interesting things that's happened, not just in Australia, but in a wide range of other countries, is early voting. And I actually think it's completely undermining the nature of an election campaign, which is based on the concept of party responsible government, namely 
political parties put out their policies in a party platform. Voters make an evaluation of those policies during the election campaign. They listen to the debate and then they vote on a single day. What we've seen in Australia over the last three or four elections is the rise of early voting. And in the last federal election, memory serves me right, it was almost half of the people uh, that voted early. So they're not actually listening to the messages the political parties are putting forward in the election. It's fundamentally changing the nature of electoral politics. Where this is going in the longer term is that traditional election campaigns, I think, really don't operate. I mean, this is also happening in the United States, though it varies between states. It's also happening in Britain, but also not to the same extent. But what it does mean, I think, is that people will be moving towards electronic voting at some point where they will return to voting on a single day, reinstating the nature of party responsible government, but they'll be doing it electronically and remotely. We asked people in our surveys what they really want from uh, the participation in an election, what they think would make it easier. Would it be voting during the course of a week, over a weekend? What they want is electronic voting. In fact, it's by far the most major thing that people mention. But when we ask people what is the part of the electoral process they most trust, uh, it's paper and pencil. It's not actually using electronic voting. Once that barrier is overcome, I think the nature of election campaigns will change once again. But it's, I mean, your question is a very good one because it's fundamentally changing the nature of democratic politics and what political parties do. Thank you both for your presentations. I um, think the level of dissatisfaction with democracy is, is really concerning. And I think, Dr Cameron, you mentioned one of the factors might be the frequent changes in leadership. I just wondered whether there were any other factors or if you could comment a bit more about that. Sure. So uh, studies looking at attitudes towards government have looked at three areas that can influence uh, these attitudes. One is the nature of political institutions. Uh, the other one is cultural change, things like uh, generational change, things like a society having a higher level of education. Um, and the other area is government, government performance. So I've done some investigations of this in Australia and uh, the primary driving factor uh, seems to be government performance uh, because we've had stable institutions over this time so that can't explain what has happened. And cultural change is something that tends to happen more slowly whereas in Australia we've seen a, a steep decline um, over time. So, and government in performance can incorporate both political performance, an example of which is the leadership changes. And we see plenty of other uh, examples of politicians acting in ways that seem to advance their own interests rather than the interests of the Australian nations, things like um, the sports uh, rorts scandal and so on. Um, but another important factor is economic performance. When the economy um, is doing better, people will be more satisfied. And when the economy is doing poorly, uh, they will be less satisfied uh, with the way democracy is working. And what we saw even preceding um, this current crisis that we're in, there was over the 2010s increasing pessimism about the state of the economy. And that also contributed to these trends that we have seen. One thing I might just add to that is people have huge expectations of what government can actually do. And in our surveys, we ask people, do they, do they receive any form of benefit from government, age pension, disability pension, family tax benefit, A or B? We find that about two thirds of the electorate receive some form of direct government benefit. Um, that creates great expectations what government can do. And of course, government can't do all of these things. So that necessarily leads to dissatisfaction. So I think a lot of this is to do with um, the creep of government into people's lives in terms of what they do and the benefits they provide. And then when those benefits are unmet, that generates dissatisfaction. Yeah, at the back. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I, I found it very uh, interesting and enjoyable. Uh, I have a two-part question. Part one uh, relates to the satisfaction with democracy. Uh, and speaking as a rather conservative oldie, uh, 
Um, I wonder whether part of that might be the level of understanding among younger voters about democracy, about its fundamentals, and about the alternatives. And the second part of the question is, I wonder if there's uh, any correlation between wealth inequality and the uh, evidence of a lean to the left. Thank you. Yes, so, so on the uh, decline in satisfaction with democracy, we see that this isn't just taking place among young people, it's taking place across the different age groups. So young people are a bit less satisfied with democracy, but uh, the decline for them has been similar as the decline uh, for other age groups. So explanations um, about this being young because of young people don't fully um, add up. In terms of, of wealth inequality, we do see uh, that those who are less well off, uh, whether uh, that means lower incomes, lower levels of education, uh, these uh, individuals have lower levels of satisfaction with democracy compared to other voters. The other important thing to note, uh, I mean, we look at dissatisfaction with democracy as a, as a problem, but in some ways there can be benefits to an electorate that has some critical attitudes towards government. High levels of trust in politics and politicians is good for effective governance, whereas uh, critical attitudes can be good for accountable governance. So it's about striking a balance there. I wondered whether your survey enabled you to say anything about the effect of Clive Palmer's huge advertising campaign. I noted that you said that increasing numbers of people make up their mind at the last moment, which would tend to make advertising more effective than it might otherwise be. Yeah, I've spent 30 years avoiding media facts in an election because they're extremely difficult to measure. Uh, people pick things up uh, from the mass media and so on, but they also are affected by other things. The sort of surveys that we run, very difficult to tease that sort of thing out. Now, what we do see is people that follow social media have a, a particularly different view of politics and so on. They are more critical, even when you take into account that those people tend to be younger. Um, but it would be extremely difficult to try and as they make some robust estimate of the effect of that on how people voted. Any more questions? Ah, oh, yes. Thank you. Um, going back to um, the issue of early voting, um, is there information in the data or are there raw data about what people want for early voting? Um, I'm thinking that based on your answer that if we move to electronic voting single day, that could possibly disenfranchise a whole huge segment of the population. So I'm wondering if there are any data that support where you think we might be going. Well, I think where we might be going is what I suggested, which is electronic voting. But this is, pro this is decades away, perhaps. And it would require convincing people that electronic voting was relatively safe, because people do say they trust paper and pencil. What people want is convenience. I mean, one of the other terms for rarely voting is convenience voting which is the ability to cast a vote maybe two weeks before election if they happen to be traveling. People have busy lives, so they don't necessarily have the opportunity to vote on a Saturday. Uh, a lot of people tend to work now on a Saturday, whereas they didn't in the past. So all of these changes in workplace, in social relations and things like that are driving a lot of this. And it's probably also worth saying that what uh, a system that has compulsory voting where you enforce people to vote really has to be as easy as possible. And were there pressures to change the nature of voting to make it easier for people to do that, 
then the, the institutions really have to adapt to it. So I think that's one of the other reasons why we've seen such a spectacular rise in early voting uh, in Australia compared to a lot of other countries. Now, um, I've been forgetting to look up into the balcony seats and there is a microphone up there. Was there anyone upstairs that wanted to ask a question? No, they seem content, uh, as does the rest of the audience, I think, at this point. So thank you uh, once again to Dr Cameron and Professor McAllister for an interesting presentation, which has obviously prompted a, a lively set of questions from the audience. So thank you to your participation too, people who have come to join us uh, here in person and also those people that are joining us online. Our recording of the lecture will be available on our website, as will be um, some more information about our lecture series for the rest of the year. And thank you once again.